Hello and welcome to Coleman University's Continuing Professional Development Training Series. In this session, we will examine questioning techniques focusing on oral questions in the classroom. Oral questioning is a deceptively simple teaching tool with great power. Let's get started. In this lesson, we will look at why we use questions in the classroom, how to construct good questions, and the various types of oral questions available to us. We will focus on questioning technique and provide some good practices for the use of questions in the classroom. Oral questions provide a host of benefits to the classroom teacher. They force students to engage in learning more actively by stimulating their thoughts. They have to consider what answer to give to the question. Skillful use of oral questions allows an instructor to quickly determine the level of pre-existing knowledge in the classroom without the need of pretests. This allows teachers to provide instruction at an appropriate level. Oral questions can arouse interest in the topic by increasing curiosity or self-interest. They can be used to focus attention on a given learning point or to reinforce that learning by causing the students to have to repeat concepts using their own words and phrases. Perhaps most importantly, Oral communications open the communication path between teacher and student, allowing instructors to learn more about their students and students to learn more about the topic. Knowing that oral questions are important only begs the question as to what makes up a good one. Consider the three A's. Oral questions should be appropriate to the student's level of understanding. Instructors should aim slightly above the student's comfort zone rather than being too simplistic or too complex. It's difficult to catch a fish if your lure is three feet out of the water. Second, instructors need to be sure that students are aware the request is coming. You don't want to bury the lead. Rather than asking, English has 26 letters in it, including vowels, which are, a construction which allows the students to slip into listening mode instead of warning them to be ready with their answers, Good oral questions lead with an interrogative word so that students can be prepared to answer. It acts as a warning flag to gain their attention and increase likelihood of answering success. What are the English vowels is a better choice. The third A, not ambiguous, allows students to focus on the key point. Questions should be clear, concise, and pointed toward a single idea. Knowing these basic guidelines for good construction of a question, let's examine the basic types of oral questions. There are seven. The first type of oral question is the factual closed-ended. This type of question can increase recall by forcing students to bring back specific information from their memories. It works similar to drilling to increase recall through repetition. In addition to its basic purpose, Closed-end questions can be used to focus the class on a given learning point, verify a prior learning was achieved, interest the students in a topic, or to check for an appropriate level of instruction by ascertaining the level of existing knowledge. These questions are relatively straightforward. They start with an interrogatory word and ask for a given fact. Here you see some examples of these types of questions. The first could be used to arouse interest through its deceptively simple answer. It's five, not four. People always forget the spare. The second can focus attention. There are four states that meet this criteria. The last two can be used to check for learning or instruction level. Where the close-ended questions lead to a single fact, this type of question seeks to avoid the single simple answer. Thought-provoking questions encourage application of existing knowledge and can be used to demonstrate comprehension. They tend to start with an interrogatory expression that leads to a general topic or specific situation. This allows instructors to drill on key learning points by forcing the students to consider them as more than simple facts, but rather components of a more complex whole. Be careful when using this type of question. It is far more difficult to manage the answers than it was with the closed-ended questions. Instructors should be prepared not only with the questions and their place in the lesson, but they should also practice how to deal with potential responses. 
here you see some examples with interrogatory expressions underlined. Note that no one simple answer pops out at you. Instead, the question seems to open a focused discussion on the topic, which is exactly the point. Interest arousing questions are the most fun to use. You can find excellent examples of these in most marketing literature, where this type of question has been raised to a high art. These questions motivate students by engaging their curiosity in the topic. The questions are not standalone. Most have some sort of hook or turnaround in them that the instructor will then use to start the discussion on the topic at hand. Some questions, by the nature of their answer, are made to shock the students out of complacency and have them look at the topic in a new light. For instance, this first question can get students thinking about how dangerous it is to use air travel. But once the instructor has the student's answers and is given the proper number in response, the teacher can then demonstrate how much more deadly traveling in a car is, especially within five miles of your own home, an area most people consider safe. The second question forces students to think about how small investments can build over time with the power of compound interest. The third is an amusing way to demonstrate the power of numbers. Do the math. What is billions and billions times the width of one hamburger? Even with these three examples, it should be obvious how easy it is to take an interest arousing question and spin it into the start of a powerful lesson. Multiple answer questions are designed to increase class participation and involve even the quiet students in the topic. Because there is more than one answer to the question, it requires more processing to discover which answers have been left unspoken by classmates. It can get quite competitive and forces students to become better listeners. Although the multiple answer question can be provided to just a single student, it is far better to share the wealth and allow each student only one answer. Converting the question from one interrogative to a statement can sometimes help avoid answer hogs. Here you see two questions, given both as a general question and as a statement that seeks a single answer from the set. You may find using both together, question then statement, is a way to control class responses. At the opposite end of the answer spectrum is the closed yes-no type of question. These are primarily used to control the flow of the lesson. While they can be good lead-in questions that cause the students to begin considering a topic, they're not inherently motivational. They can be used to divert attention of the students or to switch them from one topic to another. Use caution as it is easy to overuse this type of question. When overused, students tend to mentally flip a coin and will then just throw out an answer, not knowing or caring if it's correct. These types of questions can be morphed into canvassing questions by simply adding the phrase by show of hands before the question itself. Be prepared to deal with the smarter students who refuse the binary trap and will provide their own answer. It depends. Acknowledge that response, but force them to make a choice. While the world may be in shades of gray, black and white are easier for the learner to pick up as constructs. Like Perry Mason, teachers enjoy leading questions. When used properly, these tend to build student confidence as the answer is typically hidden within the question. However, when clumsily used, it can be perceived as being insulting to the student's intelligence. These questions are often used as follow-ons to earlier questions that a student is struggling with. By rephrasing the earlier question and including a part of the answer, the student is given a crutch or a life preserver to grasp at. Skillful instructors can use this type of question to direct students toward a particular answer or topic and emphasize key points. In classes with highly achievement-oriented students, overuse of this type of question can bore them. Here you see a follow-on leading question to the earlier McDonald's questions. As a lead-in, the second question allows students to make assumptions about the internal rate of return. They know the number 20 is greater than the number 4, so they leap to the correct conclusion that a 20% IRR is greater than a 4% IRR. And the final example builds the thought process the students should use into the question itself. If the door is hot, the room on the other side may be in flames. 
The seventh and final type of question is an old school means of getting even the most quiet students involved in the class discussion. By making them give a response, even a nonverbal one, we know they're still tracking with us in the class. The purpose of this type of question is to develop interest or motivation toward the topic, but it is excellent at determining experience level. How many of you have ever driven a car? Canvassing questions are an excellent means of building from known to unknown topics. Many of your students may have driven a car, and now you're going to teach them how to drive a school bus. There are many similar skills, but there are also major differences. These types of questions are also a wonderful way to get attention, especially if you know from your experience that most students will answer incorrectly. If given a choice of two investments, one claiming to return 20% and the other claiming 4%, which is the least risky environment? Show of hands, how many say 20%? How many say 4%? The answer, by the way, ceteris paribus, all of the things being equal, is 4%, which we can segue interesting discussion on the accounting for risk. One key point. Don't embarrass the students by making them admit things publicly they wouldn't normally want known. Now that we've seen the seven basic types of questions, let's look at how to use them properly. The basic technique to use in oral questioning is apple. The first step is to ask the question. As we said earlier, keep it simple, directed toward a single idea, and start it with an interrogatory word. Then pause glancing over the class to assess comprehension. Don't skip this step. Let your students think about the answer for a moment. Then pick a student to answer the question. Choose someone whose expression seems to indicate an ability to answer, but don't always pick the same few students. Occasionally pick the quiet students who refuse to raise their hands. By doing so, you send the message that you are willing to ask anyone for the answer. This means everyone must have an answer available to give. Then carefully listen to the student's answer. Assess and acknowledge the quality of the answer, correcting it as necessary or using a leading question to help the struggling student. Emphasize and repeat, if necessary, the correct answer. This is a fairly simple and straightforward technique, but it does take practice to make it second nature. There are some do's and don'ts which you should be aware of. You don't want to pin the fly to the wall, also known as rifling. This is when you pick before you ask. Johnny, tell me the capital of Alaska. By focusing the spotlight on Johnny before he's had a chance to think, it is highly unlikely he'll be able to answer correctly, even if he actually knows the answer. Don't be Ferris Bueller's teacher. Quickly repeating the question does not increase the likelihood of an answer. 1066? 1066? Anyone? Anyone? 1066? Battle of Hastings? Anyone? It doesn't work. Ask once, then follow Apple. Shooting from the hip is similar to pinning the fly. The difference is that you do ask the question, but then you do not pause before selecting a student. What is the capital of Alaska? Johnny? Again, by not allowing students to think before they're forced to answer, they're going to be less successful. Remember, you do not have bad students, only good students answering badly. Focus your attention on the answer, not on the person giving the answer. Saying that answer is correct, but only if we ignore the risk factors, is different than you ignored the risk factors. Public shaming is unlikely to provide better answers in the future. Do take the time during your ask and pause phases to look around the room and establish eye contact with everyone. It's sneaky, but this way everyone's worried about getting picked, so they all think about a potential answer, which is what you want. Telegraphing the punch is letting the students know that a question is coming. Starting questions with interrogatory words or phrases, pausing before starting a question, or even something as simple as, let me ask you this, 
allows students to mentally put on their thinking caps in time to hear your question. Pick your students appropriately. Again, you want a mix of all the types of students. Don't let Billy Brown Noser answer everything, or fairly soon no one else will bother thinking about your questions at all. Your goal should be to ask a question of everyone in the class during the course of your lessons. That's how you spread the joy. Remember that answering in public can be a very painful experience for some students, so provide them positive reinforcement regarding their answer. If the answer is wrong, find something good to say, even if it's just, well, at least your shoes were tied. Finally, remember that this is not a dyad, not a one-on-one -on -one conversation, but a discussion. If the room is large or the student's voice is soft, make sure you repeat the answer so that everyone gets the benefit of hearing it. Let's move beyond the basic techniques now and look at some of the other options and concerns in the classroom. As mentioned in our last lesson, your body and expressions send messages to your students, especially when you're asking questions. Look at this teacher. Her body language almost begs for a response, and the expression says she isn't going to punish a wrong answer. The use of an open hand, open eyes with raised eyebrows, a big smile and direct eye contact all say, I'm on your side, and I'm with you. Help me by giving an answer. The importance of proper physicality in the classroom cannot be overemphasized when it comes to asking questions. Two other helpful techniques for oral questions are to first force yourself to call on non-volunteers. Yes, it's far easier to pick on Billy Brown Nose. You're sure he's going to have the right answer. But all of your students need a chance to shine, even if they don't want to. As we've said before, make it a goal to call on every student in your class. This technique sometimes means you'll pick a student who doesn't have the correct answer. Prompting, using techniques such as leading questions or adding in small pieces of the answer can be used in that situation. But sequence the prompts from the least help to the most help. Allow the student to think after the prompt. If the student still doesn't get the answer after two or three prompts, you may have a situation of diminishing returns. You may wish to ask the student, would you like some help with this? Once you get their permission to ask someone else for the answer, the pressure is off them. Prompting can be a dangerous activity, as students can feel bad about the experience if they can't answer and the teacher continues to hound them in public. It's quite possible to permanently shut down a student in your class by using this technique improperly. I strongly suggest you master the other techniques before deciding to take on prompting. Two advanced techniques that can be very helpful in the classroom are the reverse and the redirect. Both involve answering a question with a question and not actually answering it yourself. In the reverse, the student asks the instructor a question but the instructor decides to let the student answer it. You repackage the question and send it back to the student. For instance, the student asks, why should we have to create such difficult passwords? They're just that much easier to forget. Rather than justifying the use of complex passwords, a topic that has just been gone over in class, the instructor may decide to reverse the question and asks the student, what do you think might happen if a hacker was able to quickly gain access because of a simpler password, say to your bank account or your email. In the course of answering the teacher's question, the student answers his own. Slightly more difficult is the redirect. It works in the same way, but instead of lobbing the question directly back to the student who asked it, the instructor returns the question either to the whole class or to a second student for her comment. Class what do you think would be the results of a hacker gaining access to your bank accounts or email because you had a very simple password to break? Or, Joan, you told us earlier that you were a victim of identity theft. Can you share with us what happened when your password was hacked? Again, these are advanced techniques, and you should always be sure that you know the answer before reversing or redirecting the question. The last two advanced techniques that we'll be looking at are seeking further clarification and refocusing. 
In cases where students give an answer that is partially correct, but not clearly correct, instructors may wish to ask the student to restate their answer. Perhaps it's not the answer itself that was wrong, but how the student framed the answer. If the answer still is not clearly correct, instructors may wish an additional explanation. Juanita, when you said that risk should be balanced by rewards, what did you mean by that? It's a relatively painless way to ensure that the student, along with the rest of the class who's hearing her answer, has gotten the correct answer, thus reinforcing the learning point. Refocusing is an excellent technique used to reinforce a prior learning by pointing out what the answer to a current question says about or echoes a prior learning point. If I asked you, what should an instructor do to avoid shooting from the hip, and you responded, pause before picking a student, I could then refocus the answer by saying, that's right, remember the first P in Apple. Ask, pause, pick, listen, and evaluate. Pausing before calling a student allows our students to think and increases their likelihood of success. By properly building the question and my response, I'm able to redirect the student's attention and reinforce a prior learning point. Question jail is when an instructor has turned a class against him or her in such a way that they refuse to answer questions. This is normally caused by a failure to understand the basic questioning techniques discussed earlier. Some of the best ways to avoid question jail are to never paint yourself in a corner by asking a question you don't know the answer to, planning your questions and building them into the lesson plan so that you don't run down a rabbit trail you can't follow, carefully listening to students' answers so that you don't accidentally praise a wrong answer or abuse a student who in fact gave the correct answer. Never use questions to punish students, either by embarrassing them in public or constantly asking questions of them as a payback for earlier misbehaviors. Any of these can cause you to have a sentence in question jail. Your get out of jail free card is practice. Oh, one last point to make. Just like we've asked you to remove your verbal pauses from your speech, strike the phrase, can anyone tell me from your lexicon. The answer is always the same. Yes, someone can, but that's not the answer you're really looking for, was it? Simply march right to the question itself. Start with the interrogatory phrase or word. We've covered a lot of ground in this particular session, and I hope that everyone now realizes just how powerful questions can be, both as a means of classroom control and student motivation, and how important it is to plan their use. Remember Apple, the most basic technique for oral questions, and practice it in your classroom. You've seen seven different types of questions in this lesson. Find one or two that you really haven't used in the past and start playing with them. Teaching skills require practice to perfect. We hope you've enjoyed the class and look forward to seeing you next time when we shift from oral questions used in the classroom to written questions used in testing. We'll be examining how to construct good test questions and how to minimize the chances that your students will cheat during exams. Best of luck, and as always, have a wonderful day.